does not belong. It's important for us to note what John is saying, what John is drawing our attention to, that the reason we are not condemned is because of the indwelling. You see, God cannot condemn somebody that he himself dwells in who walks according to the indwelling. I don't know if you get what John is trying to help us understand, that the fact that the, fa the Father has indwelt us by the Spirit, he cannot now condemn us as we walk by that Spirit. So what then happens, I want you to be thinking about what I'm about to say. What then happens when somebody has been indwelt by the Spirit, but now continues to live by the flesh? Think about that. Let me repeat. John has drawn our attention to the fact that there is therefore now no... By the way, let me just make this comment. Some of you may be using a Bible uh, in which verse 1 is not complete. Let me show you some examples. This is the New King James. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Some translations leave out the B part of this verse, but it's very important. For example, the NLT says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. That is incomplete. The contemporary English version says, if you belong to Christ Jesus, you won't be punished. That is very incomplete. And uh, the NIV says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is incomplete. So always check different translations. It says, those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, are those who are not condemned. So the indwelling qualifies us. Actually, the indwelling is simply you know, an act of God's grace to show that we belong to him. It says, they that don't have the spirit do not belong to Christ. They that don't have the spirit do not belong to Christ. So God cannot condemn somebody that has his spirit because that is God's seal of ownership, proof or evidence that this one belongs to me, they will not be condemned. So what now happens is that as somebody who is indwelt by the spirit, having received this gift of grace from the father, the indwelling of the spirit, I must live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. So the question is, what happens if as somebody who is indwelt by the spirit, I continue to live by the flesh? Will I still not be condemned or is there condemnation waiting? The answers are all, the answer rather is in this passage that we have read today. So I, I want you to keep your, your eyes still in this passage as we continue to explore. Charmaine, you had a comment earlier. Please go ahead. Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. We'll come to mm -hmm. questions. Uh, we're taking questions at the end. Right now, we're, we're trying to explore what this passage is saying to us. We'll come to questions later. Okay? Yes, Mercy? Okay, um, I think the answer is in verse 12. Where it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you push to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So that explains the consequences of living by the flesh and also the reward of living by the spirit. Yeah. Thank you, Mercy. Very, very insightful. Verse 12 answers the question I threw out earlier. So even though you are indwelled as a believer, born again, maybe even tongue talking, you are church attending, demon chasing, Kesha attending. You are active in church, but you continue to live by the flesh. That verse says that you will die. That means you will experience spiritual decay. You will not live, you, you will not enjoy and experience the fullness of that abundant life that Jesus says he has come to give. In which case now, verse one no longer applies to you. 
because it says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who live not according to the flesh but according to the spirit so those who live according to the flesh verse 12 says they will die but if you put to death the misdeeds of the body, is it verse 12? Um, yes, we are, we are not debtors to the flesh. Verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So God had a responsibility. He paid the price. He gave his only son. Jesus settled the matter for us. The Holy Spirit now lives in us, but we have a role to play, to live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. So the reason why many Christians, though they are born again, but they seem to be struggling, they, don't, they are not able to please God, is because they are living by the flesh. Thank you for that, mercy. Let's take one more person, and then we'll make some progress. One more person, any comment? from this passage we have been looking at today. There's one on the chat box, allow me to read it. Okay. From Sheila, I draw my lesson from verse eight. When one lives in the flesh, he or she cannot please. For one to please God, one has to live in the realm of the spirit, indwelling of the Holy Spirit enables us to overcome flesh and please God. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. That's a very important point. And that leads us to the next thing I actually want us to do. I would like you to look at this table. I wanted us to do a bit of um, um, study together on the flesh and the spirit. Life in the spirit, life in the flesh. Now, sorry, life in the spirit, life in the flesh. Let me exit this so that it will be easier to, I would like to type some things so that it will be easier for us to monitor this together. From verse five, let's look at verse five and let's note what it says about life in the spirit or those who live according to the spirit. And then verse five also, those who live according to the flesh and so on and so forth. What do you see? What does it say about those who live according to the flesh and then those who live according to the spirit? Anybody? Verse 5? Yes, go ahead. In this case, you don't need to raise your hand. Just go ahead because we don't have much time. Um, while we're working on this table, just go ahead, unmute yourself and give a response. I, I can see like from verse five, like the difference from those living according to the flesh and those that living according to the, to the spirit. The, the difference is the, the things that they, they set their minds on. Mm. Mm. So those- okay. So we can say, those who live in the spirit set their minds on spirit. spiritual things. Yes. And then what about those who live according to the flesh? Things of flesh. Things of flesh. Thank you, Samuel. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, all right, so let's go on verse six. What do we discover from verse six? Life in the spirit, life in the flesh. Uh, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, verse seven. Verse seven, what does it say about this contrast? The mind set on the flesh is death. Sorry, is hostile to God, is hostile to God. 
It does not Hello. submit to God's law. Hostile to God does not submit um, to God, okay? Thank you for that, Ingina. Does not submit to God's law. What about the spirit? It doesn't say so explicitly, but we can draw um, a parallel or we can draw a, the opposite of being hostile to God and submitted to God. How do we phrase that in the spirit? I think it's okay responsive. to say it. Agree, yes. Responsive agrees with God, submits, isn't it? Yes. Submit to God's law. Okay, good. Verse 8. Verse 8. Those who are in the realm of flesh cannot please yes. God, whereas yes. those who are in the realm of spirit pleases God. Okay. Cannot please God. It doesn't say may not please God or will not please God or shall not please God. It makes a categorical statement, cannot please God. So is it possible to be born again um, and have the Holy Spirit living in you, but as you walk in the flesh rather than in the spirit, you are not able to please God? The answer is yes. Since this that they that walk in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And then those who walk in the spirit of course, uh, the converse of it is that they please God. Okay, let's go on. Uh, our time is running very fast, but um, we can still draw out a few other extracts from the rest of the verses. A, a few other extracts from the rest of the verses. Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13. 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Okay. All right. So you will live and you will die. So we're, we're just drawing the, the contrast, the contrast from these two types of lives that each of us can subscribe to as we want to, okay? Can somebody spot anything else that we can, we can draw from here? Let me just, because of time, you know, verse, I'm seeing something in verse 15. It says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. So like uh, the song that we used in worshiping at the beginning, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's the song we began to worship with at the beginning of the meeting. And so, in other words, no fear. What about this, the, the flesh? We can conclude fear because people who are living in the flesh cannot approach God with a fond affectionate and gentle approach and call him Abba Father or whatever, you know, Abba is just father in, in, in Hebrew. So use your own language. If you are Kikuyu, if you are Hausa, if you are, you know, Swahili speaking, you have a pet name for your dad, one that you affectionately, your heavenly father, you can call him. Those who are living in the flesh cannot approach him like that because there is fear. But it says we have not received the spirit of fear. All right, let's continue to extract one or two more, and then we'll, we'll move on. Verse 17. Can you see anything in verse 17? What does verse 16 and 17, when you combine it, those who are in the spirit, those who walk according to the spirit, what do they become and what do they get the children of god children of god and as children what do they get inheritance yeah. inheritance thank you you know we become heirs what about those who walk in the flesh 
the converse of it, what does that mean for them? Slaves. What happens? Slaves. Slaves. Thank you. So we, we, are, we are sons who get an inheritance. Slaves don't get anything. When a slave gets an inheritance, ah, that master is extremely benevolent. A slave though, is not entitled to receive anything. So we can say slaves, no inheritance. So it's possible as a child of God to end up without receiving what the father has for you simply because you are walking in the flesh. The flesh disqualifies you from receiving the things that the father has for you. Okay, let me pause here. If there are one or two more general comments on this passage, and then we'll move on to some practical applications. Anybody is feeling an impression to share something from this passage? I'd love to share something um, from verse two, when it spoke about the law, um, sorry, verse three and four, um, where Samuel shared the righteous requirements of the law being fulfilled in us. I noticed in verse three, uh, it says, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. So I noticed that why the law could not be fulfilled in my life is that it was already weakened by my sinful nature. I could not obey the law. And so God um, did, like he fulfilled this by Christ, Jesus being born in my very nature and overcoming sin and being able to fulfill the law. And in that case, now I get to qualify to have fulfilled the law through Christ Jesus. So I think for me, that was quite, uh, when he says that now he's given us the spirit and the spirit you're told is a helper. So I see how he's really a helper because now I'm qualified to be to, to be said of one who has fulfilled the law in as much as I couldn't do it in my former nature. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That is very, very insightful. So in Christ, we have fulfilled the requirement of the law. It is no longer something we are trying to do. It has already been done. So what are we called to do? Abide in that which has been done. When Jesus said it is finished, you know, you remember that passage in scripture where Jesus said he cried out on the cross, it is finished. He brought us to the place whereby we are no longer under the condemnation of the law. We are not trying to keep the law. You see, Romans 7, where we studied last month, is not our standard. A lot of people, a lot of, I've heard Christians draw solace, <laughs> comfort themselves by saying, after all, Paul also struggled in the flesh. No. Paul was describing, that's why when you are reading Romans 7, it's not complete until you read Romans 8, 1 to 4. You now begin to see that Paul was describing a state of people who are trying to observe the law, but all that effort ends in futility. I remember one example years ago, a sister that uh, we met, she attended one of our meetings in, in Nairobi. This was around 2013 or 2012. And this sister never used to miss attending Kesha. For those uh, not from Kenya, the word Kesha means overnight prayer. You know, these nightly prayers that people attend. And every Friday, she would not miss because her pastor or whoever was leading that um, fellowship told her that if you don't come for Kesha, if you miss Kesha, you miss night uh, vigil prayer, then something will happen to you the following week. You could be caught in an accident or one disease will come upon you or your mother will be cursed or something will just happen to you. So this sister was so, you know, conscientious, ensuring that she attended Kesh every Friday night because somebody has told her you need to do something rather than telling her that, Christ has done it for you. You need to rest in that and then produce the fruit of abiding in Christ. And in that meeting, when a friend of mine who we had invite, invited, Brother Festus, was now teaching on the cross, this sister began to weep 
in class. And we didn't, we didn't know why until we now interrogated her. She said, oh, for, the, for several years, she has been attending Kesha. No matter the cost, she will be there because she didn't want something bad to happen to her. She's trying to keep a law that somebody has saddled on her, not knowing that we are actually called to rest. Now, let me put some balance to this. Rest does not mean that we do nothing. If you read this scripture, it says we walk according to the spirit. Walking in the spirit requires my active participation. So now let's go to some applications. Let me draw our attention to verse 5. For me, verse 5 is crucial in understanding this whole arrangement that God has put in place for us to live in victory. Verse 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So you see that there is a mind set here. It is a mind that is set. It is a mind that is set. Verse 6 says, for to be carnally minded, carnally minded is death. So the mind is where most of us believers struggle with. We've not been able to renew our minds that enables us to walk in the spirit without, without struggle. You see, the moment that there is a mind that is controlled by the flesh, no matter what that person does, they cannot please God. Actually, that mindset will be hostile to God. It cannot submit to God's law. He or she may try. They may apply some effort, but at the end of the day, the experience of Romans 7 will keep being repeated. The things I want to do, I'm unable to do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. So it, the, it is the mind. The mind is the control tower of your life. I want us to look at this. Um, let's do a quick uh, application on how we can unset the settings of the old mind, the mind that we were born with, that interpreted life in a certain way. That mind was not renewed at the point of salvation. At the point of salvation, your spirit was reborn. Regeneration happened, but the mind is still, you know, uh, formatted based on the old order. The world had made us think in a certain pattern, and the believer who is born again now genuinely loves God, but does whoever does not unset the old settings of the mind, that person still cannot please God. Let's look at a few things. Um, practical implications of a mind that is not set means that, number one, we've mentioned it cannot please God. Now, we don't have time to read all these scriptures. You may want to write them down and then go and do your study later. Colossians 3, 1 to 3, Philippians 3, 15 to 16, 1 Peter 4, 1 to 2. All of these scriptures talk about resetting or unsetting the old mind and then setting our minds now on the things of Christ. This thing about walking in the spirit is not some, you know, um, esoteric, unexplainable, abstract, you know, spiritual concept. No, the spirit cannot function, cannot, the, 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 the walk of the spirit, when the Bible says we should walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the loss of the flesh, that cannot happen without the mind being onset. The old mind wants to control our lives to think in a certain way. That's why Colossians 3 says, you know, since we are seated with Christ, you know, since Christ is seated uh, above, we should set our mind on things that are above, not on things that are beneath. So it is possible to be a believer, but you have set your mind on things that are beneath. You are still thinking like an unbeliever. Your, your pattern of thought, what you want to do with your life, where you want to go, how you interpret certain events, how you, how you relate with things like money, like fame, like position, power, uh, beauty, and so on, is a mindset. So you find believers trying to dress in a certain way, 
is a mind set that we inherited from our old man. So even though we learned in Romans 6 that that old man was crucified at the cross, that old man, that man, that old nature that had a mind that was programmed in a certain way, that person was done away with. But unfortunately, because we have not unset that old mindset and then reset it based on Christ, based on the word, we find ourselves still thinking in that pattern. So just take time and go and read these scriptures and then you'll see how scripture tells us over and over to unset the old mind. For example, a mind that is, that is based on the old system thinks about you know, prosperity and success in a certain way and then beauty. Let's start with prosperity and success. What would you say is the, the mindset in the world about prosperity and success? Give me some words. When the world says somebody is successful or they are prosperous, what do they mean? Money and fame. Money and fame. Mostly okay. it's materially. Mostly it's materially. Thank you, Aaron. Uh -huh. Yes, Big. materially, money and fame. Uh -huh. Having degrees. Having degrees, yes. This person is highly learned. They are successful. They have gone to school. They have, they have multiple degrees. Uh huh. Big houses. And... Sorry, Nakola. Big houses and cars. Big houses, big cars. Yes. Somebody was saying something. Titles. 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 Thank you. You know, uh, Doctor So and So. Um, ambassador so and so, senator so and so, uh, and so on and so forth, senior pastor so and so, reverend so and so. <laughs> uh, oh, my video is acting up. Let me just, uh, I have a problem with my videos. Okay. All right. So let's go on. So now, but how does God view these very things? First of all, let me ask, is it wrong to have a big car, a big house, titles, and, um, and uh, degrees and all that? Is it wrong? Is it sinful in itself? Clearly, the answer is no. The answer is no. But then, those are not the mark or the yardstick or the measuring line by which we define success and prosperity. But the... The Christian, many Christians today still have their minds set on these things as a means of achieving success. Uh -huh. And if you are one of such, uh, then it means that you are still being controlled by the old mind. You cannot walk in the spirit. You are walking in the flesh. And the table we drew earlier on the right side of it shows the consequences of walking in the flesh. You know, there is death. You cannot please God is not submissive to the law of God. You will remain a slave, no inheritance, and so on and so forth. Okay, what about beauty? How does the world measure beauty? When they say somebody is beautiful, what do they mean? Hello? How does the world define beauty? Dressing in a way to expose. Dressing in a way to expose. Thank you, Joy. Uh huh. Looking like Beyonce. Looking like Beyonce. Thank you. <laughs> Who said that? Yeah. It's okay. You don't want to expose your. You, you are not. You don't. You don't want to look at like Beyonce. Uh huh. Encanta. You mm -hmm. want to say something? Yeah. Being a figure eight. Figure eight, thank you. So you see them, some of them will go and tighten their midsection just to squeeze that part and then bring out the curves. That's beauty to many people. They will starve themselves, you know, and all that just to look, you know, in their own definition, beautiful. Anyone else? The skin color. Skin color, skin tone, yes. Thank you, Judy, yes. Who else? Aaron, you were saying something? Yeah, I wanted to say the skin color in terms of bleaching. Bleaching, thank you. 
They believe that a fair skin is the mark of beauty. Uh -huh. Have you guys seen some extra eyelashes that some people are putting on these days? Maybe it's not common in your country. Have you seen those eyelashes? They're almost one inch long. Have you seen some claws? Some extra nails? I call them claws. Yeah. You seen them, eh? Yes. I see those claws. I, I keep my distance because I don't want to have scars. When you try and shake such a person, anything can happen to you. So I keep my distance. You know, why do people, why are they not content with the fingernails that God has given them? Why are they not content with the eyelashes? Because the world has told us that beauty, you need to enhance yourself with those things. And at the end of the day, we have believers, Christians. Let me just say this. Eh? Is there anything wrong in looking beautiful? The answer is no. The Bible itself says that we are fearfully and beautifully made. All things that God has created is beautiful. He makes all things beautiful in its time. So there's nothing wrong with beauty. But these things that we have just measured, mentioned is not the way that God measures beauty. So when you find a believer walking in the flesh, you can tell that their definition of beauty is according to what the world has said, not according to what God says. Very important that we explore these things. So when you compare what we have said, with the biblical or the spiritual understanding of the same concept, then you'll find out that we are dealing with, look, for example, Joshua 1.8, there is nothing mentioned there about cars and houses, lands and money in the bank and titles and degrees. To God, success is measured by how much of his word you meditate on day and night and you are careful to observe or to obey according to what is written there. It says, then you will make your way prosperous. As far as we know, Joshua did not build big houses. He didn't have titles, you know, degrees, and, you know, he didn't own 10 chariots in Israel. No, the man was studying the word, meditating on the word day and night, and then obeying it. And indeed, Joshua became a prosperous man not by the abundance of his possessions, but by fulfilling the commission to lead the children of Israel into the land of promise. God told him that if you want to be prosperous, if you want to be successful, it's not about acquiring things. It's not about gathering titles, degrees, and reputation around yourself. It's by studying my word, meditating on it, and then being careful to obey. And then you will experience Prosperity. To God, prosperity is doing what God says, fulfilling the will of God for your life. You see that it's very different from that of the world. So when you walk in the spirit, your definition of things, your outlook to life itself will be radically different from that which other people are defining life as. Beauty, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 3 to 5, it says, don't let your beauty be that outward adorning of the hair, you know, bleaching of the skin, attaching extra eyelashes, you know, extending your finger, you know, having extra fingernails, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, you know what the things that people do? Go to great lengths. I'm not saying you should not look good. But if you are doing that for beauty's sake, there is a problem. Because something tells you that you are not content with who God has made you to be. You need to enhance your beauty in order to be accepted in certain circles. So it says, let your beauty rather be the hidden man of the spirit, the inner person. So you find people who will spend time before the mirror applying makeup and and i'm not i'm not i'm not being hard on the ladies there are guys who do all kinds of things they go to the gym and you can, you should go to the gym i'm not against going to the gym but they go to the gym to work out so that they can you know have a physique that is you know that deserves a second look or they want to go to the gym to build themselves and have six pack and so on and so forth but this same person 
this same guy or this same lady that pays so much attention on the outward beauty of the body is not interested in developing the inner man, you know, even to a greater measure. They snack on the word, spend, you know, 10 minutes quiet time, you know, uh, five minutes of prayer, but they can go and do two hours in the gym. She can spend 30 minutes before the mirror applying makeup, you know, eye pencil, lipstick, blush, and so on and so forth, extra hair. But time in the world that nourishes the inner man, that produces the character of Christ from the inside is not given attention because the world has told us that beauty is when you do these things. Prosperity is when you have these things. In God's own perspective, however, none of those things make a man prosperous. None of those things make a person beautiful. I hope this is making sense. We're talking about unsetting the settings of the old mind. If we're going to walk in the spirit, in the reality of what Christ has done for us by fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law and making it possible for us now to walk in our true inheritance, our responsibility is to now unset the settings of the old mind. That means that what this book says becomes your standard for defining everything in life. Let me repeat that statement because that's my closing statement. If we're going to apply um, these things that we have studied today so that we do not walk in the flesh, but we walk in the spirit, this book has to become your standard for defining everything in life. If you can't find it in the book, you are not obligated to take the definitions that the world gives you about anything. The book is comprehensive. The Bible gives us God's position and posture on everything that we need for life and godliness. So let me say this quickly. Walking in the spirit is not some abstract thing that we can't trace or track. Some people want to walk in the spirit, but they ignore this word. They ignore this, um, this book. It's impossible. It's impossible. To walk in the spirit, your life must agree with the word. The word of God is in agreement with the spirit of God. But if you do not study the word and then renew your mind by the word on setting the old settings of the world, then you will be a believer indwelt by the spirit, but walking according to the flesh. And that will be a futile struggle. We've looked at that table and the outcome of, or the consequences or uh, ramifications of walking in the flesh, even though you're a believer. So those applications are simple, they are practical. It's up to us now to take what God says about these matters and then begin to walk them into our lives. Let's take a couple of questions and then we will spend the time to, some time to pray. And then after that, we will, we will take some announcements and close. Charmin, you had some questions earlier or a question? Please go ahead and ask. Okay, you, you've answered it. My question was, what does it mean to walk in the spirit according to the spirit? Yes. Okay. So the answer is simple. Every time you do the Bible, you are walking in the spirit. That's the simplest way. To, I don't want to confuse you by saying, oh, go and pray, go and hear the Holy Spirit. There's a voice that will speak to you, and then you do that. No, every time you apply biblical truth to your life, you are walking in the spirit because the word and the spirit, they agree. So the simple answer to your question is, do the word, you are walking in the spirit. Ignore the word. When I say ignore the word, you may be reading it, but you are not doing it. And you are taking your definition of life from the world, then you are walking in the flesh. Is there any other question or comment from, from anyone? Yes, Jellioth? May I ask and say, is uh, walking in the spirit is by when you're reading the word of God. Would I also say that when you set your mind on the things of the spirit, it's also the same answer by reading the word of God? 
Uh, it's not just reading the word of God. Many, many, many Christians read the word of God, but they are living, they are walking in the flesh. You can memorize the whole Bible. That does not mean you're walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit, see the word walk, W-A-L-K, is an active word. Reading the Bible is not what God has called us to. It is obeying the Bible. Joshua was told, be careful to meditate on this word day and night and to observe it. That word observe is an old English word that also means to obey. That means to practice, to practice, to put it, to put it into active operation. So reading the word of God is not synonymous with walking in the spirit. Obeying the word of God, which you have read, is what is walking in the spirit. Does that help, Jellyoff? Yes, it helps. Thank you so much. Okay. Sir. Because as you read the word and you meditate, reading the word alone does not renew the mind. Reading the word gives you information. You now know what God wants. You now know how the kingdom functions. But it is in meditation that you bring another force to dislodge the mind that was set on pleasing self, the mind that was set on doing the things of the flesh. You bring a word through meditation. Meditation means to reflect on it continually until it dislodges, it breaks through the stronghold that has kept your life bound, even though you are born again, but walking in the flesh. So meditation then now empowers you as you get a revelation of what you've meditated on and you begin to practice it. Your life takes on a whole new dimension and definition of what you can no longer be deceived by what the world calls life. You know, your, your understanding becomes different. You begin to walk in a direction that people cannot even understand you anymore because you are being governed from another dimension. So it's not just reading the word. A lot of believers read the word, but we don't meditate on it and we don't obey it. So that we still end up struggling with the flesh. Ken Francis? Um, my question is uh, obeying the spirit sometimes let's let's take for a scenario whereby you feel like fasting or you feel compelled by the word of god to fast but you are fasting and have we lost ken francis am i the only one in can you hear him he lost you i can't hear him not fully obeying uh, there were gaps in your comments Thank or your you. question. Yeah. Would you like to please repeat? Uh, I was asking the times whereby when we are compelled by the spirit, let's say, let's take for instance to fast. And uh, somehow you're still fasting, but you're still fasting, not fasting because you feel not like fasting, but you're fasting, you're like hunger striking. Are you still working in the spirit or in such a case, you're actually working in the flesh? I think you've answered your own question because there are guidelines for fasting in the scriptures. There are protocols, let me use the word protocols that govern spiritual disciplines and the things we do uh, to build up ourselves. Uh, there are people who fast for wrong reasons. Obviously God cannot respond to that fast. There are people that fast for wrong motives, um, and pursue wrong reasons for fasting, God can. So basically, I mean, the protocols are clear. If you, if you study Isaiah 58 and a few other portions of scripture, Jesus shared, told us also in Matthew 6, how to fast, how not to fast. Um, so you cannot do a spiritual activity and claim that that is walking in the spirit. You can actually pray and fast and share the gospel, but you're walking in the flesh. It's very possible to pray all night. Um, let me give one example. We used to have a neighbor, uh, my wife and I, when we were first married, we used to have a neighbor who prays every night without fail for hours. But you see, what she was praying about was, she was praying out of fear and torment against enemies, you know, people who want to uh, uh, destroy her son's uh, children's life. That is not working in the spirit, but she's praying. There are people who preach from the pulpit, but they are walking in the flesh. So it's not just the outward things that we do, 
everything now matters from actually the New Testament Christianity is a transfer of our consciousness from the outward to the inner so that it is what happens on the inside that now comes out on the outside. So people fast, they pray, they go on evangelism, but all that can still be walking in the flesh. So you may have, you may have started in the spirit because what you said was like somebody was, felt compelled by the spirit to fast. Yes, the Holy Spirit can actually tell somebody, set out some time and wait upon me. But when the mind has not been renewed, you now switch into the, you, there are things that you begin in the spirit Paul asked the Galatians, how is it that you began in the spirit and now you are ending up in the flesh? You are now dependent on your efforts, your own works to try and get things done. So it's not the activity we're looking at. It's, it's every area of our lives. We're called to rest in the finished work of Christ. Truth be told, our fasting doesn't produce anything by itself if it is not resting on the finished work of Christ. Let me repeat that. Our fasting and our prayer and our preaching does not produce anything of itself if it is not resting on the finished work of Christ, because that would mean that you are trying to lay a new foundation. But scripture says there is no other foundation that can be laid except Christ. So even when we fast, we are dependent on his finished work, and then we begin to, we, we now walk in the spirit based on that which he has done, not what we are trying to do. If not, we'll be going back to the struggle of Romans 7. Joseph Kilonzi, we'll take that last comment or question and then we will begin to close. Okay, I, I wanted to uh, comment on, um, on uh, what it means, just to hand a comment on what it means to walk in the spirit. Yeah, uh, that... Uh, Walking in the spirit means it, it, it's, it's when you go through the word and the word goes through you. And it is, it is very possible for, for you to go through the word, but the word does not go, go through you. Because if, if, if that word has not, if the written word has not become live, live or living in you, then you are not walking in the spirit. So um, it, it's, it's when the written word becomes becomes it it, be, it 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 lives in you it becomes a life it's alive in you you know uh, jesus will tell the, the pharisees that uh, uh uh they you search the scriptures thinking that you will find life in them but you miss it because you don't find christ in it so uh when when we when we find we find christ in the scriptures you know because christ is life we begin to live, to pattern our lives with the life of Christ, then we are living in the spirit. So that's what Thank I you. wanted to. Thank you very much, Joseph, for that very vital addition. Um, actually, walking in the spirit is becoming one with the word. Walking in the spirit is becoming one with the word. And we know that the word is a person, is more than a book is more than a physical book that you read to extract principles to live by. It is when you and the word are in agreement, you and Christ now are living in oneness. It begins with engaging this book, but ultimately you find yourself thinking in biblical frameworks. You are not able to relate anymore with the seductions of this world. Whatever is thrown at you, the word becomes you filter everything by the word because you and the word have become one. And that is not something you do by snacking on five minutes, 10 minutes of Bible reading per day. We're talking about entering the word and then like Joseph said, allowing the word to enter you. You become one with the word. There was a man who um, fought the Philistines. I'm just using this as an Old Testament analogy. One of the mighty men of David who with his sword he, he killed, was it 800 or 1,000 Philistines defending a field of lentils? We, and the Bible says that at the end of that fight, the sword that he used clung to his hand. His flesh and the metal of the sword had become one. The, it was, they had to pry his fingers off that sword. The sword had melted into his flesh. And the sword, the, we know that the sword is symbolic of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
that man and the sword had become one. Our lives and this book. But you see people who are reading the word, like Joseph said, the word is not entering them. They are trying to get in the word, but the word is not entering them. We must immerse ourselves in the word until it becomes impossible for us to think outside of the biblical framework. Then we will walk in the spirit. Okay, thank you everyone for the questions and the Sorry, comments. Sir. Yes. Sorry, sir. Faith's hand has been up. I don't know if she's. Oh, I must have yes. missed that. Sorry, Faith. Do you have a question or a co contribution to make? Yes, uh, but it was answered. I was just wondering uh, why Solomon, why God made Solomon rich and Abraham. Sorry, why God made yes. Solomon rich and Abraham what? Was also very, very rich. Like, what, uh, what is the purpose? Oh, that question is not in the context of what we're studying today. Okay. Yeah. I think she asked that question. Sorry, sir. She asked the question when we were talking about life in view of possessions and okay. against uh, what uh -huh. we're sharing. She asked her okay. about Solomon on the chat. So maybe. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Uh, first of all, there is nothing wrong with riches. We have to be crystal clear on that. Uh, if you study God, you'll find that God has no problem with giving people riches. Uh, you've mentioned two. I can give you a litany of other people in scriptures that God prospered, even financially. You see, um, people have this wrong notion that God is a killjoy. He wants to keep you poor, you know, and he, he doesn't want you to have money. That is very, very unbiblical. What God is against is us worshiping money. You know that Solomon, even though it was God that made him extremely wealthy, but Solomon ended poorly because his heart departed from God. Now, Abraham, the, one you, the other one you've mentioned, his heart did not depart from God, even though he was wealthy. And there are many other people who were wealthy. So the issue here is that in the Old Testament, People measured blessing and prosperity often from the outward, what you have. But in the New Testament, remember I said that uh, New Testament Christianity is about transferring our consciousness from the outer to the inner. In the Old Testament, God did not live inside people. He blessed them materially. In the New Testament, God has not just given us blessings, he is the blesser that has moved inside us. People who envy Solomon's wealth, Christians who envy Solomon's wealth do not know what they have. When Christ is in you now, Solomon actually looks like a pauper. If you know what you have and you can walk in the reality of what you have received, all of Solomon's wealth, Jesus compared Solomon's wealth that it was not as it was not as much as, Solomon was not as well-dressed as the grass of the field. Can you imagine? So the problem is not the wealth, it's not the prosperity, it's not the possessions. It is lives that have not been set on the purposes of, I wish I had time to, to our time is actually over, but I wish I had time to unpack this in detail. Christians who pursue material prosperity at the expense of their souls, do themselves harm. I think Paul made this clear in 1 Timothy chapter, was it chapter 6? They, they do harm to their souls. So faith, God is not against blessing people with money. But you see, in the New Testament, we have something far more than what Solomon had, far more than what Abraham had. It's the new covenant. Now, many people don't know what is contained in that new covenant to begin to even unpack and enjoy it. So Solomon still looks wealthy. In relation to what we have, Solomon should be pitied. He is poor compared to what we have. We just now need to begin to explore and to unpack the unsearchable riches of Christ living in us, which Solomon did not have. So God wants to bless all of us. But the question is, how do we define blessing? Is it like the world? Or is it um, you know, the way that God thinks of blessing? 
Okay, thank you. I think we should take a few minutes to pray and then uh, Ingina will lead us, we will share a few announcements with us. I don't want to dictate prayer points tonight. I don't want to tell us what to pray. I want, based on whatever you have gleaned or gathered, based on what you have, you have harvested out of the word tonight, take that to God in prayer. One of the ways I actually encourage you to pray is to pray the word. So you may have Romans 8 open before you and give thanks in some verses, pray out some verses, make commitments based on some verses, repent based on some verses. Let's unmute and pray together. Father, thank you. Because there is no condemnation in me as long as I walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Thank you. Thank you because I am not condemned. Thank you for what you have done in fulfilling the requirements of the law. Thank you, Father, because you sent your own son in the likeness of sinful flesh in the flesh on my behalf. So that that requirement can be fulfilled. I'm so grateful. I no longer need to follow the law. I no longer need to attempt to do things by my own Thank you, because I will not dwell with a carnal mind. I will not dwell with a carnal mind. I want to explain the light and the Thank you, because I will not walk in enmity against you. Rather, Life and peace that come from the spirit. The evidence that possible I to give life to my own house. I that as many as I the spirit of I thank you because I am not keeping the spirit of bondage in the spirit of and now I speak. Oh, my father, oh, my father, you draw me here by that spirit who bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. Deliver me, Father, a child of God. I thank you, because I am a man of God. I am not in I am not cast away. I am accepted in the beloved. I have been brought near. I have been predestined to adoption. I Amen. Every one of us, as we close tonight, I want to encourage every one of us to make a commitment to with as many people as possible between now and our next meeting on the last <laughs> kindly don't keep this to yourself don't keep this to yourself whatever you've gleaned tonight share it with somebody one way to multiply not multiply one way to retain what you have received is to multiply it spiritual physical things when you give it away you have you could lose you have lost it spiritual things when you give it away you gain it back in multiple fold 
That's why Jesus says, be careful how you hear, for to him who has, more will be given. That means what you do with what you've been given determines whether you qualify for more. So I just want to encourage you, go back and study these things. The Holy Spirit will expound other portions of scripture that uh, buttress these truths tonight. But pass this on to other people between now and our next meeting. Use social media, use WhatsApp, use your cell group meetings, use one or two, three people that you are discipling, but pass these things on so that people can walk in the victory that Christ has purchased in us. There is nothing more pitiful than a Christian who is born again, has the rights in the kingdom, but is struggling with the flesh. It's very, very, uh, it's just not what God designed for us. So this Bible study series is to help us come to a place where we can access our inheritance in Christ and live in the fullness of what he has for us by working with, with a renewed mind um, and all that God has for us. Thank you very much. Uh, Ingina, you have some announcements for us? Yes, sir. we are grateful. Thank you so much for blessing us uh, and for allowing God to use you mm -hmm. this evening, even share the word with us. I'd like to just bring in a few announcements. Um, how beyond uh, as we as we see what God is doing and as we learn of God's heart, how can we become involved in what He's doing? And there are various ways. Can you, we inviting you to join in prayer? We've talked about talking in the spirit, and you can join in prayer by getting involved through GAP, which is the Global Activation Prayers. Uh, this is both in Telegram and on WhatsApp. There are prayer channels. Uh, links will be posted on the chat box, so keep keep watch of them as they come. You just click on the links and join. You will receive daily prayer points from these groups. You can also be a goer. You can also join in going. Um, you can move by. Sorry, I uh, can hear some noise. Allow me to just mute it. Thank you. Sorry about that. You can. In, you can be involved in going, becoming part of what God is doing, even through going to other nations that have not yet had the gospel. These are people groups. Some are already in Kenya, are in Kenya, are in the nations we're in, in Nigeria, in the various nations. This can be a short term mission exposure um, or even long term. And in short term, you can be part of a program that we call RUN, Reaching Unreached, Unreached Nations, which is an, an internship for graduates and uh, young, young people who can use skills or whatever God allows them to use as a platform in the various places. Please reach out to us. Contacts will be posted on the chat box. You can reach out to us for this also. The next way you can be involved um, is also in Ready to Run. This is a six week online mission, mission mentoring program for campus and college students and young professionals across Africa. Uh, this training has really opened the eyes of many who have gone through it and their lives have been transformed. Join, be equipped, be trained, you know, to be part of God's army. The day of his power is people shall be willing. Apply now. Uh, you can go to our website. The website link will also be posted. So you can click on that and register. The closing date for registration is 10th April. So please mobilize your friends, register. It's six weeks, it's intense, and it's good. It's going to cause a change in your life by the masses of God. Lastly, um, not lastly, but we're also inviting you to be part of GIFT. GIFT is Global Investors for Transformation. This is becoming part of a community of people who are giving towards seeing the advancement of the kingdom, even using their finances. How can you, um, you can give, we're having a project to sink a well in Tana River, but knowing how the drought has been, you can, it, it's, it's, it's a blessing to these nations by giving them the physical water and also creating opportunity for the water of life to reach to them. So please uh, contact us on the number on the screen and also it will be posted on the chat box. Kindly, Nancy, post the number where you can be able to find out how you can be able to give. It's for students, it's for young professionals, it's for everyone who wants to be part of what God is doing. Follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Activate Movement. 
And find, um, join the One Life WhatsApp group. Again, the link is on the group. Just click. Conversations are ongoing and more resources are shared on the group. Finally, join us tomorrow for all those in Kenya and invite all those who are outside Kenya for our an, um, meeting, a prayer meeting that we're having tomorrow from 8 to 10 p.m. It's a um, virtual meeting, it will be on Zoom. It's just to meet and to pray together. Let us pray in that which is also important in the heart of God. We'll be praying for the nations, we'll be praying for the Muslims, we'll be praying over their work and we invite you to join us that we can collaborate together. Thank you very much. Um, and I think if there's any, I'd like to know if there's any announcement from Joseph Kilunzi. No, no more announcement, uh, uh, Gina, thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, we can unmute and share the words of the grace. We're very sorry for the time. Um, we'll do better in the future by God's grace. Let's unmute and share now the, with the grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. And the fellowship of the Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. And Julie, again, the last Thursday of the month. Let's meet here. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Good night. Good night. It's a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my.